Hello everyone, my name is Nico and I am a second year robotics doctoral student in the Neurobionics Lab directed by Dr. Elliot Rouse. In this presentation, I will provide you with a high level overview of the research that we conduct in neurobionics. Our lab has two primary pillars. The first is biomechanical science. This includes system dynamics of human locomotion, neural control of movement, and physiological perception. This is the starting line for most of our research questions. The second pillar of our lab is wearable robotics because these systems are typically necessary to answer our research questions. These two pillars are complementary to one another because understanding of biomechanical science informs the design of novel wearable robots and these new wearable robots then facilitate research in unexplored areas of biomechanical science. The engine that keeps the cycle in motion is our lab's mission to improve the quality of life of millions that suffer from lower limb mobility deficits. This includes those with lower limb amputation, post-stroke hemiparesis, cerebral palsy, the elderly, and many more. In practice, this process begins with a question. For example, what changes in prosthetic stiffness can be perceived by the user? Or what are the mechanical properties of the ankle joint during walking? This can be anything. We'll also consult conditions and the existing body of the literature that ensure the research question is fundamentally sound and relevant. The next step is to acquire the necessary hardware. Uh, this usually falls into two cases. If you're lucky, the ideal case is that the hardware necessary is already available and su sufficient. You can just go and buy it. If the research only requires commercially available tools such as motion capture and instrumented treadmill, EMG sensors, or maybe a commercially available device or a device that we've already developed previously in the lab, then we're in luck and we can proceed the research immediately. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. We often find that the hardware we need does not exist. And in this case, we have to leverage the existing literature to develop novel wearable robots that make the research possible. Lastly, we conduct experiments that answer the research question that we started with. And in the end, we have more literature and more capable robots available to us when answering future research questions. This process builds on itself and is most efficient when the hardware is of high quality and capable of exploring several research questions. This process has been repeated many times, so we have many research platforms in use within the lab at the moment, and I will highlight several of them here. We have the variable stiffness prosthetic angle foot and the variable stiffness orthosis. I'm going to introduce these two together because they're related to one another. They're both passive mechanisms capable of modulating the ankle stiffness with each step, and they actually both use the same transmission. Uh, but the one on the left is a prosthetic intended for amputees, whereas the one on the right is an orthosis for those with intact legs. This next device is a powered knee exoskeleton currently aimed at characterizing the impedance of the knee while walking. This is the Defy Exoboot, a powered ankle exoskeleton. And lastly, the open source robotic leg, which aims to provide a common hardware platform that is available at low cost to researchers across the globe. All these devices are untethered and we actually developed them all within neurobionics with the exception of the Defy Exoboot, which is commercially available and developed by an exoskeleton startup called Defy. For the rest of the presentation, I'll briefly discuss each of these wearable robots and the research associated with them. First, I will cover the Variable Stiffness Prosthetic Angle Foot, also known as the VISPA. The VISPA has a cam transmission that deflects a spring as the ankle rotates, the cam surface will push on a bearing that is attached to the end of the spring. This bearing is very low friction and will just roll along the cam surface as the spring deflects. The spring deflection at each ankle angle is governed by the cam shape, and we can intelligently design the cam shape to achieve a specific torque angle relationship at the ankle joint. The spring is a simply supported cantilever beam. The simple support of the spring is motorized and can be actuated during leg swing to change the stiffness of the ankle joint. The motor is actually really small and doesn't inject any energy into the user's gait. It instead just changes the support of the spring when the device is unloaded and the prosthetic is off the ground. Moving the support closer to the ankle joint will increase the stiffness of the torque angle relationship and moving the support further from the ankle joint will decrease the stiffness. I'll conclude discussion of the VISPA with this video taking during walking trials with the prosthetic. 
Mechanism stores gravitational energy at heel strike and when the body travels over the foot during controlled dorsiflexion. You'll see here at heel strike, we're storing energy, body moves over the foot, storing energy, and in late stance, this energy will be released to propel the foot into the next step. Some of the research questions that we have investigated with the VISPA are, what ankle foot stiffness do people prefer during walking with a passive prosthesis? What is the minimal change in prosthetic stiffness that is perceivable by the user? How does user preference differ from clinician preference? And what underlying biomechanical and metabolic factors drive user preference? Typically, a passive prosthesis prescribed in the clinic will have nearly the same stiffness throughout the entire ankle range of motion with no means of adjusting the stiffness. The clinician might initially prescribe an amputee of prosthetic stiffness based on factors such as body weight, age, and activity level, and then later adjust the prescription based on observations of the amputee walking in the prosthesis. For example, the cl clinician might look at their gait symmetry and with the experienced amputee, the clinician might even ask if they would prefer a prosthesis that is more or less stiff. But in either case, the choices are limited because the clinic doesn't have the tools to test many different stiffness levels. The underlying factors that drive amputee preferences are largely unknown, and a stiffness that works for flat walking in the clinic may inhibit other activities such as walking or stairs or inclines outside of the clinic. This is where the VISPA can be advantageous as a potential tool that could aid clinicians in the prescription process by allowing them to quickly test many different stiffnesses with fine resolution and as a platform to understand the underlying mechanisms that drive user preference. This research is possible with the VISPA because you can intelligently design the torque angle function to vary stiffness throughout the entire ankle range of motion instead of having it be the same and can increase or decrease the overall stiffness with each step. Another platform we have in the lab is the variable stiffness orthosis, also known as the VSO. This hardware operates on the same fundamental principles as the VISPA prosthetic, except it's meant to be worn by people with an intact limb rather than an amputation. You can see here that as the slider changes position, this torque angle function is going to be scaled, uh, basically increasing or decreasing in stiffness. Research questions of interest here may look familiar because they're analogous to the VISPA research. Some of the questions are, what ankle foot stiffness do people prefer during walking with a passive orthosis? What is the minimal change in orthotic stiffness that is perceivable by the user? And how does user preference differ from clinician preference? So these questions are just as relevant here as they were in the prosthetic case, because typically people get prescribed an orthotic with just one stiffness. It's a stiffness that is able to support their entire body weight during level ground walking, but might not be comfortable during other aspects of gait or during other ambulatory tasks, such as walking upstairs and on inclines, just as we discussed previously with the prosthetic. And this is actually, I think, a first of its kind, the ability to not only have continuously variable stiffness in a ankle orthosis, such that the stiffness changes with the ankle angle continuously, but also the ability step to step to change the stiffness if you want. This could be useful as like a future commercial device, but also to clinicians. Uh, it could be a tool for them to test many different stiffnesses before prescribing a stiffness to a patient. And this is the second generation of the prototype that we're working on right now. The next platform I'll highlight is our knee exoskeleton. In this design, the knee is driven by a series elastic actuator. One end of the linkage is driven along a lead screw by a DC motor that you can see there in the bottom right, while the other end is coupled to the output shaft via a fiberglass leaf spring. Some of the research questions we intend to investigate with the knee exoskeleton are, how does the knee joint impedance vary during walking? And what are the effects of recreating human joint impedance in prosthetics and exoskeletons? This research is made possible by this system because it is both untethered and has torque and position sensing capabilities at the knee joint. The next platform I'm going to highlight is the Defy Exoboot. This is the only platform in this presentation that we did not develop in neurobionics. 
The Defy Exoboot is a lightweight powered ankle exoskeleton that we purchased from a robotic startup called Defy. And the early prototype of this exoskeleton was the first active exoskeleton to show statistically significant reductions in metabolic cost. And Dr. Rouse was a co-author on the original paper back when he was a postdoc at MIT. Some of the research questions we're investigating with the Defy Exoboot are, can individuals self-tune their own exoskeleton controllers to find assistance settings they prefer? What are their preferences? What underlying mechanisms may drive user preference? And how well can people sense their own metabolic costs? Much of this research is targeted at understanding the parameters people consider consciously or subconsciously that contribute to their exoskeleton control preferences. Today, metabolic rate is used as the primary measure of exoskeleton success in the compare exoskeletons, but our lab thinks that a set of parameters are likely necessary to judge exoskeletons and that metabolic rate alone is not a particularly good measure. Maybe if we had other metrics of success, new exoskeletons would appear that are better suited to improving the quality of life of people. This research is made possible by this platform because it's the only powered exoskeleton capable of decreasing the metabolic cost of able-bodied walking that is commercially available and with the ability to implement custom control. The final platform that I'll discuss is the open source robotic leg. This video is courtesy of Levi Hargrove and shows testing the open source leg at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. This prosthesis was developed to facilitate collaboration amongst prosthetic researchers and decrease the barrier to entry for new researchers. Performing prosthetics research today is difficult. You typically only have two options. You either develop your own hardware or buy something commercially. Developing custom hardware is difficult, labor intensive, and takes a lot of time. And if your lab doesn't have a good foundation in design, the end result might not be very capable whereas commercial hardware is expensive and often lacks in research capability. So what we have developed here is a third option, the open source leg, which is a light, quiet, efficient, and inexpensive prosthesis that is highly customizable. You can implement your own controller, adjust or eliminate series elasticity, and the ankle and knee can be used independently from one another. We also have a website with assembly videos, parts lists, design files, and control performance specs. The on-front development and testing that typically takes years to complete is now available at low cost. Here you can see some testing of the OSL step position response and frequency response. And this is just a cool video of one of my lab mates implementing torque control on the open source leg with a zero reference torque and closing the loop with the onboard load cell. To summarize, the primary goals of the open source leg are to 1. Decrease the barrier to entry for prosthetics research. Researchers no longer need to spend a lot of money or build something themselves to acquire a high quality customizable platform. 2. Build a research community unified under a common hardware platform. At the moment, it's difficult to compare results because everyone has different hardware and some people's controllers are specific to the hardware that they have. Use of a common platform will make it easier to draw comparisons between research groups and seamlessly build on each other's research. And three, improve the community mobility slash quality of life for lower limb amputees. This is the end goal of our research, the primary driver behind all of this. And these are all the labs that have an open source leg right now. We think this is a great start and look forward to these numbers increasing in the near future. I wanted to conclude by listing some of the primary areas of focus within the lab. I thought this might be useful to those of you that are considering doing research at the university or maybe even joining our lab in particular. Our lab is very multidisciplinary and new areas of focus often become relevant in our research, but I think these are the areas that we particularly excel at. I'm not going to read the list out loud, but it is here for your reference. Thank you for listening. The people shown here are the current postdocs and doctoral students in the Neurobionics Lab, but many others have contributed to the work in this presentation. To inquire about research positions, you can contact Professor Rouse. If you're interested in learning more, you can contact me, and I'm happy to put you in contact with the member of our lab that is most closely related to your areas of interest.